Everybody ready? Uh, hello and welcome to the Capitola Planning Commission meeting. This meeting is open to the public with both in-person attendance at City of Capitola Council Chambers at 420 Capitola Avenue and remote attendance possible. Planning Commission and staff are attending in person and remotely via Zoom. There are several ways for the public to watch and participate. Information on how to join the, the meeting via Zoom and make public comment during the meeting is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, on the meeting agenda. The public can also live stream the meeting on the city's website or on YouTube. As always, this meeting is Cablecast Live on Spectrum Communications, Cable TV Channel 8, and AT&T U-verse Channel 99, and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Mondays and Fridays at 1 p.m. on Spectrum Channel 71 and Spectrum Channel 25. A recording of the meeting will also be available on the city's website after the meeting. Our technician tonight is Walter, and as a reminder, please turn off your cell phones during the meeting. Okay. Um, we do uh, roll call. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Commissioner Esty. Here. Commissioner Jensen. Here. Commissioner Westman. Here. Commissioner Wilk. Here. And Chair Christensen. Here. And then Pledge of Allegiance. Moving along, item two is additions and deletions to the agenda. Um, we have item A and item B. Of course, staff received additional materials relating to tonight's agenda. We had four public comments in support of item 6A. And then for item 6B, the project applicant provided an updated attachment two to the staff report. And the item was updated on April 2nd and April 4th. All additional materials have been made available to commission members and members of the public and are available in the back of the room for public review. Thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, item three, oral communications. Oral communications allows time for members of the public to address the, pub the planning commission on any consent item on tonight's agenda or any topic within the jurisdiction of the city that is not on the public hearing section of the agenda. Members of the public may speak for up to three minutes unless otherwise specified by the chair. Individuals may not speak for more, may not speak more than once during oral communications. All speakers must address the entire legislative body and will not be permitted to engage in dialogue. Is there any? Um, Don't start me yet. I haven't started. <laughs> and if you could speak directly into the microphone, we have some audio issues if it's not close to your face. <laughs> okay. Good evening, planning commissioners and staff. My name is Terry Thomas. I'm a 50-year resident of Park Avenue and a former planning commissioner due to attempts to mitigate damage in Escalona Gulch caused by building on that site in past years. I'm here to lodge a formal complaint regarding the special meeting you held for two tree removal permits on March 27th, instead of having them considered at this meeting. First, the application for tree trimming and removal of 16 trees that was posted along Park Avenue was changed to the removal of 22 trees on the agenda. That's not the same. Secondly, the application to remove over one-third of the existing trees on the Rodriguez property, which is the center of Escalona Gulch, was not sufficiently notified to the public, and should have been, as this property is considered a monarch butterfly habitat by many state and local jurisdictions. It was only posted on Depot Hill. As a result, no one commented at the meeting, but I would have. I have been compelled to attend several meetings pertaining to the disturbance and potential destruction of this area should the proposed rail trail move forward, including board meetings, regional transportation commission meetings, and city meetings. 
I'm not willing to pay $594 for the privilege of appealing either of these approved applications. I will leave that up to you, since the city misled us in one case and failed to properly notify us in the other. The issue of tree removal and wildlife habitat destruction will come up again as the rail trail debate continues. Your action was discouraging, and I wish these items were being heard tonight instead. Thank you. Hi, my name is Goran Klapic. I'm an Army vet. I served in the Army overseas. I have a question. I, I don't know, I don't understand why Bay Bar is, uh, has reopened back in Capitola. Because I know, I talked uh, to Andrew Daly and Captain Sarah Ryan about some drug trafficking that was happening here in the past. I don't understand what the law issue is here. They're breaking the law. Thank you very much for listening. God bless you all. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Moving on to um, Planning Commission and staff comments. Is there any? I have three items for you tonight, and I'm actually going to, I've got slides on my three items because they're pretty exciting. So the first is that um, we're, the city is undergoing, just launched a survey for the wharf, and we're trying to figure out, um, we're going to begin a long-term process of, of what, what do we want in the long term, but in the, in the intermediate time in the next year, from October of 2024, when the wharf is set to open, through October of 2025, we'd like to hear from the residents on what temporary uses they'd like out on the wharf. So this slide I'm showing, we've gone viral today, and it's um, all over our, um, it's on our webpage, as well as on our social media posts. And so we're encouraging the public to please take the survey. And more good news, next slide. Um, the regional bike share goes live next week. So next Monday, you're going to see bikes at all the locations. You've seen uh, throughout Capitola, there's 18 docking locations, 100 docks total, and we'll be assigned 50 bikes. Um, so they'll become active on April 8th. And then on Tuesday, there is a ribbon cutting at 10.30 a.m. You're all welcome to come see the ribbon cutting. And um, that will be on Cliff Drive overlooking the wharf, so in the spot where we've got bikes up there. And one of the reasons why we chose B-Cycle is they're very proactive on their customer service. They have allowed us to put their phone number, which you can send texts to or call to get customer support. And they also welcome direct emails. So that, that is one reason they were chosen as well as the fact that they've got docking stations so we won't be seeing bikes everywhere. They're very orderly. So with that, that's my update on the launch that happens next week. And then last, I think we're all aware of this now, since it was it didn't happen last time around, but the RTC is closing Highway 1 for, sorry, it should say a 24-hour closure. It's going to start this Saturday night at 7 p.m. and go through Sunday at 7 p.m. They're expecting lots of traffic, so the messaging has been stay close to home. Um, southbound Highway 1 will be... You'll be directed off the highway at the Bay Avenue Porter Street exit. And then if you're heading northbound on Highway 1, you'll be directed off at the Park Avenue interchange. So a lot of cars driving along Soquel Avenue or through Capitola this weekend. So just want to bring that to everyone's attention, the not so good news. <laughs> but with that, we'll, uh, Commissioner comments? Uh, on the survey, how long do you anticipate it'll be open for the public? Um, so at least two weeks. Mm -hmm. Anybody? Any other questions? Okay. Additional comments? No. Okay. Nope. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to uh, consent calendar, item five. All, ma all matters listed under the consent calendar are considered by the Planning Commission to be routine and will be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. There will be no separate discussion on these items prior to the time the Planning Commission votes on the action unless the Planning Commission requests specific items to be discussed for separate review. 
Items pulled for separate discussion will be considered in the order listed on the agenda. Item A is approval of March 27, March 27th, 2024 Special Planning Commission meeting minutes. I'd like to pull that for discussion. Okay. Um, can we, for item A? Yeah, excuse me, I want B. Okay, sorry. Well, we're, I'm okay with the minutes. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to make a motion? <laughs> Uh, I move with consent calendar uh, item 5A. I'll second them. Commissioner Asti? Aye. Commissioner Jensen? Aye. Commissioner Westman? Aye. Commissioner Wilk? Aye. And Chair Christensen? Aye. Um, item B is the New Brighton Middle School 620 Monterey Avenue and Monterey Avenue Park. This is for a proposed land exchange by and between the City of Capitola and the SoCal Union Elementary School District regarding a portion of the New Brighton Middle School, uh, 620 Monterey Avenue. So shall I just ask my question or bring up my issue? I don't, um, I don't know that we need to go through a whole presentation. That would be fine. So my concern, I realize that this is a city council that actually rules on this, but I, and we're asked to at least review it and give comments. And so the, my concern was specifically on the pathway. Uh, I um, we call it area A. If you could bring up that slide that the overhead that shows area A and Yeah, well, that, that's exactly the a, a perfect slide because it shows that pathway which is existing, which is kind of an, an, a narrow area, um, very enclosed. I know that the police department is always talks about, like, for example, when we talked about Rispin Mansion, they made sure to lower the fence so that they could have good view sites and whatnot. So this is already there, but if we're having a new... L to that area A then makes makes the left hand well depending if you're coming down that you turn right so that I if there was a fence there now all of a sudden you have this long narrow pathway that as as uh, Gorn Klepich points out there's there's crime or potential crime in Capitola I would worry that um, that if the the um, Oh gosh, the middle school plans to fence off their area that, that we would have that very narrow thing. And so I would at least want the police to, to weigh in on that. And before it went to city council, just to have that brought up and, and maybe there's a condition that they don't put a fence there. You know, the berm there is kind of separates things. Maybe that's already been addressed and I just didn't, didn't get it, but that's my issue. We, we can bring those comments to city council of, to keep that as an, if there's a gate there that it's open and you can see. Well, I'm just, again, I'm, I'm not worried about this line of sight, but the new area A that we're, we've got, if they, if they fence that in, then you've got two pathways that are exactly like that in an, in an L configuration. And, and I think that might be um, troublesome. Yes, uh, thank you and good evening, everyone. Um, so that portion of the pathway A, as, as is part of the, uh, the nature of this uh, application, is currently, even though it's public access uh, through there, it is school property. Um, their initial concept was to actually not have a pathway kept through there at all and to close it entirely. That's, that's my understanding. Um, this was a revised concept that that bridged the two needs of trying to pr continue to provide community access through there as well as meet the um, the needs of the school as part of their their longer range improvement plans which you can see sort of superimposed on this aerial um, I do I have seen some of those documents though they're they're uh, not fully fleshed out at least from the, the ones they've had in their their board meetings um, they were proposing to get rid of that berm. And one of the, the key focuses of their improvements too is uh, security for the school, for the students, as well as 
monitoring student behavior. That, that was also a component there. So I think there's a lot of mutual interest in, in addressing what you're bringing up here because there's as much interest to probably see what, uh, what's going on in there as there is to protect the uh, activities inside the school uh, boundaries. So I, I think we could bring this up through staff and to the city council. So it seems like this is a project that we still need to take some action on tonight to either vote for it, against it, or, you know, officially continue it. And um, I'm wondering if the uh, issue could be resolved by simply saying uh, the school district, as far as I know, up at New Brighton Middle School only uses chain link fence. They don't have any solid wood fences. And so if, and I'm certain that they're going to want to have um, this area fenced, we could add a condition to our approval that that fencing only be chain link or some other type of open fencing so the pathway is clearly visible um, from the school district side. I don't, I don't, again, since this is a city council action, I, I don't feel the necessi necessity to uh, put a condition on it. I just wanted to bring it up so that the city council does, in fact, consider that, or maybe the police department says, yeah, don't worry about it. Um, I wouldn't even want to put a condition on it, but I would want to bring it up as a uh, as a point of interest. And with that, I would like to make a motion to approve consent item 5B. Do we have a motion? I'll second. Just a second. We, we do a roll call. Commissioner Esty. Aye. Commissioner Jensen. Aye. Commissioner Westman. I, I think it's wonderful that this is finally being done because this idea has been batted around for at least 25 years so the school district could finally have a regulation size playing field. And my vote is aye. And Commissioner Welk. Aye. And Chair Christensen. Aye. All right. Moving on. Moving on to uh, the public hearing section, um, item six. Public hearings are intended to provide an opportunity for public discussion of each item listed as a public hearing. The following procedure is, um, we're doing a, a little modification to the procedure and Brian has a presentation. Right? Yeah, thank you and good evening, Chair Christensen and Planning Commissioners. Um, just expecting a little more interest in the item uh, 6A tonight, I just wanted to be real clear for the room. Uh, we'll do a staff presentation, followed by commission questions for staff. And then the applicant has requested a six minute presentation. Uh, following that, the commission can ask questions of the applicant. And then we would do public comments and that would lead to commission discussion and ultimately decision or direction. So just to be clear, and then I will get into my staff presentation. So uh, item 6A is 1098 41st Avenue. This is a multifamily, 100% affordable project being proposed by Midpen Housing. Uh, the entitlements associated with the project are a design permit, coastal development permit, and a density bonus request. Uh, under the umbrella of the density bonus request is four concessions and a reduction to parking to match the uh, state of California's formula for density bonus projects. Uh, the subject property is zoned medium density multifamily. A proposal includes a total of 52 units and the site is uh, just under two acres. And so other notes with this aerial photo here, uh, it's a trapezoidal four-sided site uh, tapering in, the, in a wider width toward the rear. Uh, and that front frontage is about 144 feet wide just to uh, give you some perspective. A little additional background, uh, the property was pre previously developed uh, with Capitola Manor, a skilled nursing facility that was demolished in 2022. And uh, just at the end of the last year, we received the subject application. The total project scope is uh, the demo of the foundation, remove trees, uh, regrade the site, and then the construction includes four buildings, new driveway, parking lot, utilities, landscaping, and site amenities. And 
The unit mix is four studio units, 21 one bedrooms, 14 two bedrooms, and 13 three bedrooms. Got a site plan here, uh, just to walk you around on the site from an aerial perspective. The total development is a little over 60,000 square feet. Uh, again, the one, the 52 units, we've got 70 parking spaces. Um, let me grab the pointer here. So this is building A. This is the only two-story building uh, with the, the building mix. Building B, C, and D, and these buildings kind of lay out in an in inverse L shape uh, around these two green courtyards. I'll offer a little bit more detail on those in later slides. Uh, we've got two trash enclosures and a long-term bike storage a shelter behind building C. And uh, then I've got a, little, a few notes about the parking, seven uh, short-term bike parking, there's 52 long-term bike parkings in the in this shelter, four EV chargers, and then seven capable and 17. And those are all within the 70 parking spaces that are provided here. Uh, getting into the renderings, uh, this is a view from 38th Avenue. Uh, so our design consultant that, that performed a peer review uh, characterized this as a coastal contemporary design. Uh, on the right, this is building A. Uh, this is the only two-story building. It's located up toward the frontage at 38th Avenue. And then building B is to the left. Uh, this is looking southeast from the interior of the courtyard. Uh, to the left would be building D, and the right is building C. So three-story buildings. And then another perspective, um, looking from the perpendicular parking spaces along the drive aisle uh, toward the northwest, and on the left is the two-story building A, and across the courtyard is building B. I'm getting into a little bit of the uh, architecture and materials. Uh, the roofing style is gable roofs. Um, on the long side, it's primarily three and 12 roofs, and then the, the, uh, the gable massing breaks that run uh, perpendicular are uh, five and 12. Uh, this facade itself has seven massing breaks. I'm pointing out three of them, but there's a lot of, uh, a lot of horizontal articulation that's built into this, and then vertical and articulation is really um, based on a lot of material and color Variation. There's three different types of uh, board siding, batten board, uh, lap siding, and then shingle siding up in the, uh, just below the gables. And then each of the buildings has its own accent colors uh, to provide its own theme and differentiation between the four uh, noted down at the bottom of the sheet. So getting into landscaping, uh, there's a proposal here to, to uh, remove all the existing landscaping. It's, it's really uh, kind of dated with the prior project um, and, and wouldn't fit any kind of an adaptation. And there's really no uh, prize specimen that was noted in the Arborist report. So there's 43 trees uh, being proposed for removal, 70 uh, to be replaced, and the canopy cover, coverage calculation uh, exceeds the city's minimum. And uh, all the the water use calculations uh, were well under uh, the maximum allowable water use per SoCal Creek Water District standards. Um, getting into some of the outdoor spaces, so some of the uh, other developed spaces uh, associated with uh, the landscape. Got a few arrows here. So there's three different types of pavers integrated with cast in place concrete. Uh, there's a pergola for an outdoor gaming and uh, barbecue space. And then there's a, a playground with the rubber uh, play service and some veggie beds uh, over in the, the rear part of the courtyard. Okay, I'm uh, just seeing a note here that it says 41st Avenue. Um, this really should say 38th. Sorry about that. All right, getting into sustainability features. Um, we already talked about the EV chargers. Uh, there are solar panels expected to be added on the roof. They're not shown on the plans, but uh, the applicant is saying that they are committed to adding those. 
Uh, I mentioned the low water use landscaping. The building is uh, all electric, heating and cooling and appliances. And uh, the stormwater retention system uh, meets a, a pretty high threshold. Uh, this is a tier four project. Uh, so there is a substantial on-site retention system uh, built into the, the stormwater. I uh, wanted to give you a little bit of background about uh, the density bonus. Uh, so this, this is derived from state law uh, dating back to the late 1970s. Uh, in the last five or six years, the state has uh, offered, uh, made, made adjustments offering developers uh, some more powerful tools for affordable housing projects. Uh, and so really the city's role is determining whether a project is uh, eligible for uh, a density bonus, um, really rather than um, trying to enforce a zoning or development standard across the board. So there's a lot of flexibility built in with these projects uh, in the form of concessions. This project specifically qualifies for four and um, con concession again is to reduce or set aside a development standard uh, and it's all to promote project feasibility and affordability. Uh, and the big exchange is 55 year commitment for affordability. So specifically, uh, the four concessions requested are uh, for building height. Uh, this is um, typically 30 feet in the medium density residential zone. Uh, the, the 40 feet noted here is the tallest building, which is building C. Uh, the other three story buildings are 37 and 38 feet tall. Um, and so also would be part of this height concession. Uh, number two is for private open space. So for multifamily units, 50% of them need, uh, with the local ordinance, need 48 square feet of private uh, open space. Uh, the applicant is proposing a concession uh, with all of the robust outdoor spaces and use spaces as their amenities uh, in lieu of the private open space. Uh, number three is tree mitigation. Um, so typically we're looking for a two to one replacement. The replacement proposed is 1.65 to one. And then parking lot landscape requirements. So parking lots with over 50 parking spaces require 20% to be landscaped. Uh, and this is a, a fairly high bar in Capitola because um, the perimeter of the parking lots are not counted as part of the landscape percentage. It's only a landscaping that fits between parking spaces or drive aisles. Um, so the, the, um, the subject project ends up at about 11%, and so they're asking for a concession for that standard. Uh, getting into transportation and traffic specifically, um, this type of project being an infill project is screened out by uh, the governor's Office of Planning and Research. Um, so really it, it's a non-factor for CEQA. Um, nonetheless, we did uh, take a look at the ITE modeling and uh, found that there was 12 a.m. net increased trips versus the uh, prior nursing facility and 6 p.m. trips, which are relatively negligible numbers. Uh, other aspects of um, modification to uh, traffic in the roadway nearby, the Public Works Department has worked with the applicant and uh, find a condition of approval uh, that calls for relocating the sidewalk uh, crosswalk uh, with a lighted pole uh, and lights on each side of the street. And uh, the reason for this is um, is primarily safety um, because the and it also raises the the platform of the, of the crosswalk about two feet. So vehicles traveling south on 38 um, uh, don't always see this crosswalk and. Uh, the applicant did some neighborhood outreach and, and did hear from nearby neighbors that uh, they did feel that this crosswalk would, could be approved by raising the elevation. So it's uh, moving to the north side frontage of the, of the property. I'm uh, just going to detail CEQA. I won't read all the words here, but um, the city hired DUDAC to help us with the environmental and CEQA clearance. Uh, their conclusion was that the project was eligible for an exemption an infill exemption under 15332, and that the project uh, was under five acres and meets the city standards other than the density bonus requirements, which are uh, also exempt from uh, this requirement. 
So with regard to community input, we received four written comments, uh, three letters of support, and then one uh, letter just talking about process uh, with a preference that the city council review a project like this. Uh, in terms of outreach that the city did uh, with sending postcards on the left, I've got a map of what we are required to do by ordinance. So this is a 300 foot perimeter, uh, which was yielded uh, 241 recipients. We chose to extend that north uh, to Reposa Avenue and include all residents on both sides and then south to Tranquility uh, and include the Shangri-La Estates. And uh, reason for doing that is just potential for overflow parking and uh, just impact to the neighborhood. These are the two uh, next spots. So about 500 feet north and south is what we did instead of 300. And so with that, uh, we do have the four recommended actions. So this is, uh, we are recommending approval, which would require uh, the Planning Commission to adopt the CEQA finding. Uh, approve the density bonus request and reduced parking associated with the density bonus design permit and conditional development permit. And uh, did want to note that we do have uh, city legal staff on Zoom if we have legal questions and introducing the applicant, we have uh, the associate director from Mid Penn, uh, Vanessa Diffenbaugh, and the architect from Fora Design, Jessica Goswick, and I believe they are going to have a presentation after questions for staff. So that is my presentation. Happy to take commission questions. Anybody have any? I have just two quick questions, I think. Um, we got the table on the affordability and in there it talks about the utility allowance and um, is that, uh, how do the utilities work in a project like this? Are they included in the rent? Are people going to be paying individual utilities? Or I just wondered how the process works. Yeah, we would probably defer that to the applicant. I'm not sure if it's a factor or if it's a, a real number. I, I can I can wait till they come up and I can ask them that. And my other questions probably actually for them as well. So I'll wait. Anybody have any no questions? Um, when you went over this, did you consider the driveway next to the mobile home park? And is there any noise mitigation that would be considered there? Yeah. What I want to do is pull up one of the. So yeah, this is the, the drive aisle and on the original proposal, the landscaping here um, was, was just shrubs and ground cover. And so this, this row of, of landscaping was added in, in response to uh, trying to soften that and add privacy and noise mitigation for the, the mobile home park. Yeah, I'm sorry, on the, in the rest of it, the green part, is that a fence, is that a wooden fence? I can't remember. There's a wooden fence along this boundary. Okay, it is on there. It's also on the, uh, the trail on the north side, right? That's wooden fence, except for the hedgehog stuff that they're going to put in. And I believe there's a portion of it that is dilapidated, missing, that is to be repaired with. And just uh, for my edification, what's the difference between a EV capable and EV ready? <laughs> yeah, so this this is one that we did look into the the building code to understand this better. So four EV chargers means day one, uh, there's the actual unit uh, installed. Capable is a dedicated circuit and a, a, a line run to an all weather 240 volt. So if somebody had a, a, a portable unit, they could plug in and use a capable unit. And then 17 ready means a circuit is dedicated and reserved at the panel, a conduit is in place, but it's not live. So all the transforming transformers, there are two of them, they are sized for all of these EV stations. Then. Correct. Okay. I'll ask the applicant tomorrow about the same thing. Any other questions? 
Moving on to public comment. If, if um, anybody has a, anything to say, they, um, sorry. So, um, I think with our revised oh, sorry. layout, so tonight we'll be moving on first to the presentation oh. by the applicant. Thank you. <laughs> um, if, if the applicant wants to step up and... Yeah. <laughs> Commissioners, my name is Vanessa Diffenbaugh. I'm here as representative of MidPen. I'm associate director for our Central Coast region. And I'm here with my spectacular partner, Alyssa Serrano, and our architect, Spora. Um, so first, this is our first project in the city of Capitola. We're really excited to be here. And I wanted to first just thank Katie and Brian for all their work getting to this point. It has been truly Herculean and we have some exciting financing opportunities for this project, and so they actually made sure to get us to this meeting in the hopes that we can be competitive some, for some state funding. So thank you for everything you've done to get us here. I also actually wanted to thank the seller of this property. The, um, this assisted, uh, assisted living facility used to um, be owned by Central Coast Alliance for Health, which is a partner of MidPens on some of our permanent supportive housing. And they found themselves unable to redevelop this site and brought it to the opportunity to us because they really wanted to see this really large parcel in the city be put to the best use for the city of Capitola. So we were able to purchase that from them at a good price and get to work on developing. So um, on, on the slides here, you'll see our mission. I know that MidPen is new to the city, so I just wanted to make sure that you know we're 100% permanent affordable housing developer. Our mission is to provide safe, affordable housing of high quality, to establish stability and opportunity in the lives of our residents, and to, to foster diverse communities. Um, in addition to our development work, we also have property management and services in-house. So we are long-term develop developers and long-term owners of all of our properties, or almost all of our properties. Um, and you can move to the next slide, please. And though we are new to the city of Capitola, we've been in Santa Cruz County a long time. We actually opened a Watsonville office in the mid-90s, and we have more than, we have 14 properties currently in development, as well as 14 properties currently operating, and then we have four properties that are either in construction currently or in lease-up. And one of those properties that's currently leasing up is right down the road on Capitola Road. You've probably seen it in unincorporated Santa Cruz County. Um, we developed that in partnership with Dientes Community Dental Clinic and Santa Cruz Community Health, and then we have 54 uh, units in the back. I think that's a really good um, example of what I'm really proud of in our work with MidPen. We, we pride ourselves on being really good partners to our cities and counties and um, coming in to develop underutilized um, land in a way that best serves the community. So two other examples of our partnerships. Uh, one is Parkhurst Terrace. Uh, that's on Freedom Boulevard, and that was a former mobile home park that was really struggling, and the county came to us, asked us to redevelop it. There you'll see we have 68 units of family housing. And then below, San Andreas was a former farm labor camp that was really struggling. The county, again, asked us to come in. We were able to develop um, 43 affordable homes for, fam for farm worker families, and we're currently in the process of rehabilitating that. So we really do keep up our properties over time as well. Um, so next slide. So before I turn it off uh, over to our wonderful architects, I did want to talk briefly about affordable housing and really what that term means. Um, so this project will serve 52 families earning between 30 and 60% of AMI. So we use that term AMI a lot, which doesn't really mean that much to the general public. So I did create this chart to kind of give you an example of what that actually means. So in this um, property, we'll have uh, 13 three-bedroom units, 14 two-bedroom units, 21 one-bedroom units, four studios. And you can see below there the rent ranges for each unit size based on people's income. So, for example, um, looking at the three bedrooms, I did some research on the City of Capitola staff incomes and the Live Oak Unified School District incomes and just got to a few examples of the kinds of people who could live in this affordable development. So one example I pulled there is a special education teacher. That would be a person who's maybe in 
year three to five of their teacher um, tenure, they'd be earning about $83,000 a year, and assuming they were married with a single-income family and had two to three children, they could live in a three-bedroom unit and pay about $1,800 in rent. Um, on the lower income side, if you had a landscape laborer who made only about $48,000 a year, they could have a three bedroom um, and pay only about $945. And just to answer your question quickly about the utility allowance, so typically what happens in a um, community like this is that MidPen, the owner will pay sewer, water, and trash, and then the resident themselves. Sometimes we sub meter water, sometimes we don't. I think that's something we still want to work out with the city. Um, but then the, um, it's pretty complicated, the formulas, but the resident will basically get money back um, to pay for the, the utilities that they have to pay themselves, which would typically be their electricity um, bills. So I can get you much more information than you probably ever want to know on utility allowances, um, if, if you'd like I me to. I just have a quick question. Maybe it's for the architect. Are they going to be individually metered, or is it? We're actually still working on that in the design. There's no requirement for them to be individually metered. Um, I think right now we're planning on having them be submetered, but we don't always in our property. It really depends on what the goals are in terms of sustainability. Um, is that something you want to answer? OK. Um, can we just request that you speak into the microphone so that you're on the record? Sure. So maybe I'll have the architect take the submetering and the utility, the water questions. Thank you. Um, so why don't they give their presentation? And then if you have more questions for me as developer, I'm happy to come back. Thank you. It depends. Hello, commissioners. My name is Jessica Goswick, and I'm an architect with Architects Fora. I'm here today with Yoshi Jimenez, one of my colleagues, and listening in is Sarah Vaccaro, um, our principal. Um, at Architects Fora, uh, we are an affordable housing, or primarily affordable housing architecture firm, um, entirely women-owned, and we have a portfolio of over 40 years of affordable housing in California. Um, we, our mission is to create vibrant, resilient, and equitable housing at all scales because we believe everyone deserves a place to call home. Go to the next slide. Um, so when we were approaching this project, we worked with um, a broad range of stakeholders in order to establish our project goals from the beginning. We worked um, both with our development team, our consultant team, the city, um, as well as neighbors through our community outreach to develop these goals. Um, the first one is to provide affordable, inclusive family housing that reflects and supports the capital community. The second is to understand and really listen to who will live in this development and incorporate them into the storytelling, the community engagement, and the design decisions. Uh, the third is to ensure programs, resources, and physical design provide equitable living opportunities. The fourth is to put money where it has the most impact on health and living standards for residents, um, to integrate thoughtful multi-use, multi-age outdoor spaces, and the last is to focus on the details and make sure that we're featuring art, outdoor spaces, and color uh, that is so prominent in the Capitola community. Next slide. So building on that, um, some of the quirky Capitola details and color, um, we really wanted to incorporate um, and pull from the surrounding context to reflect um, both the historic and traditional single-family bungalows that surround our site, um, as well as some of the more contemporary development that is coming up. This is a multifamily development um, located around the corner on 41st. Um, and of course, to keep that iconic Capitola color. So that's why each of our buildings has a different accent color and, each, and we have this like strong pop of orange um, at the doors. And last slide. And so this is just kind of an overview in 3D of the massing approach that we've taken on site. To the left um, is 38th Avenue. To the right is um, kind of the rear of the site bordering the O'Neill property, um, and below us is the Shangri-La development. And so the drive aisle kind of creates that buffer, previously um, the comment about noise, that helps to separate us vertic or horizontally by 30 feet from the surrounding development, as well as um, there's a vertical grade change there of about one and a half feet that also allows separation. Um, we start with two stories um, along 38th Avenue to keep things in scale and then step up to three stories deeper within the site 
to allow um, more people to live here and to create more housing. Um, these buildings create two protected courtyards. We're calling the first one our front yard and the one to the right, the backyard, um, as a place for play areas for students uh, or for children. So through these massing changes, our goal is to blend the massing and blend the project into the surrounding neighborhood. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think to speak quickly to the electrical question, just as it comes up, it is pretty tricky. It depends. Um, but we typically submit our electric so that uh, residents will pay that and then sometimes receive allowances from the developer. But water, we will likely not submit on this project. Yeah, I just wanted to make certain because I did a project similar to this in another city and we ended up with this big bank suddenly of electrical meters yeah. that were visible that had never shown up on any plans. So if they're going to be, you know, individually metered, I'm certain we can put some sort of condition in that it's going to be screened. Or yeah. All of our electrical meters will be um, interior, so we typically have them inside our electrical room, which is located in Building C. We can pull that up on a plan, too, if you're interested. Okay. And I have one other very minor question. On your roof plans, um, they all show something which I'm assuming is a skylight, but it was not marked. Mm, it's a roof hatch. I know what you're talking about. So that's so that we can have access to the roof for maintenance, um, and it's used... Uh, rarely, but by um, maintenance crews to do any roof or solar panel maintenance. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. While we're on electrical, you've got two two fairly large uh, transformers on the property. Are they uh, subterranean? It's hard to tell. If, they don't show up in the elevations, but they show up in the plan view. They're not subterranean. So they are... Oh, are they they're above ground? How high? I don't know. How you seem to be in the pathway of one of the buildings, I think, but near Building A, I think. It seems yeah, like it, it interferes with the pathway. Oh, it, uh, I don't think it should interfere with the pathway. I need a site plan. Let me show, let's go to plan view on page. While I'm asking, while I'm searching for that, the our rules would require you to have about 1,200-ish feet of private space, you know, the 50% ratio, 48 square feet. What, do you know roughly what your open common area uh, square footage is? Yes. Yeah, so we have 26% of our site as open space. Our site is just over an acre. Oh, yeah, but... There's a courtyard and things I would consider a public usage space. That that's what I'm talking about. Do you have any idea on that? There are two. There's a courtyard and there's kind of like a back. What do you call it? Backyard courtyard. Is a front mm -hmm. yard and a backyard courtyard? Yes. So you're looking for them split up? I don't know if you have any idea what total area. I'm just trying to understand relative to 1,200 square feet. It looks like it's a lot more, but I don't know. I know it's about double, but. Okay. I don't have the exact area. Plan, if you look on plan, yeah, I need a plan. A1, that dot three, you see those two relatively large transformers. There's one right beside building C, between building C and this front yard courtyard. Yes. That looks, this plan view is a big thing. Yeah, it will be pretty tall, like about four feet. And transformers sometimes, depending on wherever, make a lot of, Make noise. Have you considered that in this layout? Could you put it somewhere else? Oh, I guess the, the that transformer is right outside of the electrical room, and it was located like that in order to screen from noise and so that there's no unit directly next to it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Just um, a quick question. Um, on the mechanical units, I, I got one of the responses I think you were trying to back about is heat pumps are going to be on the for the main facilities. So does each individual unit have like just a like a package unit that heat pump and so they just discharge right to the outside, kind of like a hotel style unit? Is that what that is? Yeah, we'll use a standard kind of PTAC unit, a package terminal air conditioning um, that will be at each unit. And there's typically one in every studio in one bedroom and then sometimes two for the three bedrooms and two bedrooms. Perfect. And I was a commissioner that asked a question about regarding the solar. So in the future plans, it'd be a solar array that would be Pretty much 
at rough level. Um, so you've done sun studies that either wouldn't have to be a, an apparatus or something that when we're looking at a building at 40 feet, it wouldn't be something that would be elevated off that too. No, yeah. Um, I think like the response said, it, we want we will likely use a stanchion mounted system that's a couple inches off, and so it'll be in parallel to the roof plane and shouldn't go above the maximum height that we've identified. Additionally, because of that offset that's required for OSHA and maintenance standards of being three feet away from the roof ridge. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Okay, sorry. Uh, no, go for it. Ash, the trash by this courtyard, which was one of the RRM uh, recommendations to move it. Why, why wouldn't you just combine the two trash things together on the uh, southeast side? Yeah, the primary reason for that was due to accessibility. Um, with the site as large as this, um, almost two acres, we have a lot of residents that are living more in the front of the site, and that location is a lot more convenient to bring your trash down. Um, we find that especially in some affordable developments. There, I mean, in any new development, there are people who have mobility impairments and it's more difficult to get to different parts of the site. So it just allows more accessible uh, trash locations for everyone. Okay, okay. thank you. my microphone. So um, I, this is a great, plan, I think, and I was really impressed how well you worked with RRM. And, um, but I did have this one thing that kind of stuck in my craw a little bit, and that's the lack of native trees. And, we, and it, it's a problem with me personally, because I've been on this commission long enough where I've seen a lot of redwoods chopped down and, and, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of big, what we would normally call heritage trees, but they weren't labeled heritage. And so because of the roots were big or whatever they were they were allowed to be removed and so i'm wondering why you didn't want to have any trees that would be large enough to go create a canopy actually over the building height uh, why there was no you know live oaks why there was no incense cedars heart large cypress there's a lot of california native trees that would would be great yeah, so we can definitely take that back to our landscape architect, and he said he could look a little bit harder um, because we did get that comment earlier today. So I didn't have time to bring back specific species for you for this meeting. But I will say just so that you know, um, the, the reason these specific species were selected is that we have a few different criteria that we're looking at. We're hoping that they're fast growing, they're non-toxic, they have broad canopies to provide shade. They're really tolerant of the salt water because we're so close to the ocean and that they're low water as well. Um, so it's actually pretty hard to find trees that meet all those requirements, especially those screening trees. You don't want trees that are gonna interfere with neighboring properties. You also want them to grow quick enough to actually screen and to provide some noise barrier. So um, our landscape architect's wonderful. He's really responsive. He did a ton of research to arrive at these, and he did want to make sure that you saw there were a lot of native plants and shrubs. It was just the tree species that aren't specifically native. Um, but we can do some more research on that, absolutely, with that feedback. It does seem to be like courtyard space or something that could accommodate a large tree. I realize you probably want podocarpus or something along the driveway, um, but it seems to me there's there's room for some mm -hmm. some native. Yeah, yeah. Trees. Thank you. We can take that back, absolutely. Um, well, you're here. I just have a couple questions. Can you talk um, briefly? I've heard about the services that the last occupant of the property provided, and then what the relationship is that you have now. And sure. you elaborate on that. And then I had one more question after, after that. Absolutely. So as I mentioned, we purchased this property from the Central California Alliance for Health, and they are a managed care provider, and they, there was a skilled uh, nursing facility here. Uh, we decided after doing some community outreach and working with them that it really made more sense to do a family housing development here rather than senior or supportive because such great access to opportunity, jobs, great school great schools. So we are focused on a family development here, but um, as our purchase agreement with them, we um, agreed to serve 20% clients, um, low-income families that qualify for their 
services, which are really just very low-income families that qualify for Medicaid. Um, they're really open to who we serve and how, how those low-income families are referred. And one of the um, partnerships that we're currently pursuing, but is really still very early, um, is we're working with uh, the Santa Cruz County Office of Education to see if we can come up with a referral um, preference for families that qualify as homeless under McKinney-Vento. So those families are often uh, low-income working families that are double and tripled up, sometimes living in unsafe conditions. And so this would allow them um, a preference for 20% of the units that are coming online at this site. Um, and then we would provide on-site services and the school district would also provide services. So um, CCAH was really wonderful in terms of selling this to us and saying, you know, go build something amazing. We're not going to put strings on it. We'd love for you to serve low-income families and individuals and we're open to what that looks like. So just a quick follow-up with the uh, school district. Are you, is there also preference? Are you looking at um, some workforce housing allocation numbers as a certain percentage of these two? Uh, no, we're not looking. We're not looking at that right now. Um, we are sort of looking at that in general at MidPen because I know there's a desire for a lot of cities and cities and school districts and police force and fire, you know, to try to figure out what that workforce housing. Um, looks like in each city, and we have some ideas, but it's not something we're currently targeting for this particular property. And then, can, um, sorry, just one, another question. Can you talk about your interaction you had with the, the neighborhood and kind of elaborate on that? I know there's, we have commercial, you have, you know, mobile home park and just the whole neighborhood. How was that outreach done? Sure. So we had one community meeting at the Jade Street Community Center that was very well attended. Our architects were there. We had some interactive um, activities to try to understand what they thought the best use of the site would be. Um, and then the only other follow-up we've had was with the Shrang La um, Mobile Estates, which is right um, on our southern border. Uh, and so I've met with them both on site and on Zoom maybe four or five times, and their primary concern um, is noise, which we, you know, added the trees and, and made some concessions there. And then they're also concerned with pedestrian safety. So we met with both the city and county because that's right where the city and county um, line is. And uh, it's also, you know, there's a lot happening with the rail trail that's not totally determined yet. So there's a lot of unknowns with the, the street there and the, the future of it. But we are definitely improving our street front frontage um, as much as we can in terms of safety, and then we're relocating the crosswalk to a higher elevation and adding those flashing lights, which we think will add um, to safety. What they really want, though, is the sidewalk extended all the way down the street, and so we've passed that on to the county, but I know that's a bigger conversation, and if we can be part of that, we're happy, happy to be. And I'll just add to that also, um, we met with O'Neill, the neighbor along 41st Avenue, so... Um, and they hired a local planner, Charles Eady, to review the plans and to, to be tracking this project. So they're, they've been in communication from the beginning. And there's no response from them about this item for tonight? I heard back from Charlie Eady that he thought the plans looked great, <laughs> but nothing specific. Thank you. We're moving on to public comment now? Okay. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Very good questions. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay. If you come up to speak, please write your name and speak directly into the microphone. Good evening, Planning Commissioners. I'm Paula Bradley, a Capitola resident. Overall, the project looks good. I like the parking in the rear of the lot. The applicant responded to most of the city's design recommendations, but I would prefer to see more replacement trees planted and landscaping. I'm glad to see both short and long-term bicycle facilities providing convenient and secure bicycle parking to, to, ensure, to encourage bicycle riding and reduce vehicle trips is essential. Bike theft in our county is out of control. Residents will need to be assured they can park their bicycles securely. 
the bike storage facility would be better located if it were closer to where there will be eyes on it and not to the rear of the buildings by the trash enclosure and rear parking lot. The staff report stated that it will have cameras and a lockable gate. Please require a condition to review that the bicycle facilities design is in accordance with best practices. Bike racks should also be to current standards so that a bicycle can be securely locked with two points of contact and so that the bike does not tip or fall. If the bike facilities are not well located or safe, they will not be used. Please explain in more detail about the bicycle facilities. Will it be covered? How it will be secure? What type of lighting? And what type of bike racks will be installed? And I also brought a handout and I'll give it out. And it's just an example of good bike racks and bad bike racks. So it's just an example of what the bad ones don't use them, please. You, I still see them installed on projects, um, and I don't know why people are still using those. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, commissioners. As Suzanne say I'm a resident. I live on 42nd Avenue. Um, I want to commend you all for getting to this point. I know it takes a lot of work to get a project to this hearing stage. Uh, I read the staff report end to end. Good job, staff. Think you did a great job. Applicant, lovely job. I, I like the plan. I think it's a great reuse of the site. Uh, we need this type of housing so much in our community if we're going to have folks working in healthcare, education, retail. <coughs> public safety, whatever, they need a place to live. The current um, market rate rents and home prices are not affordable to most of Gen Z, millennials, many older folks, including, you know, myself. Uh, so I think it's, it's about time we had a MidPen project here in Capitola. I've been uh, working with uh, MidPen in my day job at various jurisdictions for 20 years. They do great work. They build wonderful communities. I encourage you to tour any of their local facilities if you haven't already. We have uh, St. Stephen's Senior Housing over in Live Oak. Um, another project, as they mentioned, just got finished in Live Oak, uh, the Vienna Star Plaza. Lovely mixed use site. And so I'm really excited. We're finally going to have a mid pen housing project here in Capitola. All of our neighboring communities have had them for a number of years. Um, I actually am a former city of Capitola planner from about 20 years ago briefly, and I worked with MidPen Housing at that time. They did some feasibility studies for us with some grant funding, and while they didn't wind up being able to acquire those sites and build those projects, we do have some housing. I think it's Capitola Villas on 41st that they played a really important role in. So I'm happy to see that they finally acquired a site here and we're gonna have some housing. So I encourage you to approve the project. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Good evening, my name is Elaine Johnson. I'm the Executive Director of Housing Santa Cruz County. Good to be here on this beautiful rainy evening. <laughs> As a member of the community, I had the privilege of attending the community meeting at the Capitola Manor Project on 30th Avenue. I was deeply impressed by the proposed layout and more importantly, the vibrant community it aims to cultivate. With MidPen's longstanding partnership with Santa Cruz County it's exciting to see them embark on their first project in Capitola. I believe this is just one of many projects to come. I stand before you to earnestly request the approval of entitlements for this project, recognizing its potential to enrich our community and provide much needed housing opportunities for people to have a safe, stable place to call home. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi, I'm a resident of the park next door. And um, I've spoken to my neighbors, and they're very concerned about the noise, especially along that fence. The trees are not going to mitigate. They would like a cement wall. And they're very concerned about the parking coming and going at night. Um, I understand the maximum occupancy is 237. That is a flood. We are going to be overwhelmed. The lack of uh, provision of parking spaces will stress the entire neighborhood. And they'll probably be trying to park in our park. We are concerned about the light pollution to the site. I'm concerned about all the, um, the um, considerations they want to, you know, um, get approval for not measuring up to their standards of the, the um, plants and all that stuff. They want that to be decreased. Um, I, I would like to see a 20-foot setback, so this is not such a looming presence on the street. I would like to see a maximum of two stories, maximum of 20 units. This is absurd to um, impose this on the community. I would like to see a show of hands of who here is ready to give up their car. I don't. I would also like to see a show of hands of who's ready to move into this unit, this housing development. I'd also like to see a show of hands who would like it to be next door to their home. I don't see any hands. I'm going to interject. We there's not a back and forth during public comment. We observe, we hear, and listen, but there's not a back and forth. Oh, you're welcome to say that later if you'd like. But I don't think I'll see any back and forth or any anyone volunteering here. So, thank you for listening. Thank you. Excuse me. My name is John Van Sagern. I live on Melton Street the south side of where this, or the north side where this project will be going. Um, and at 40 feet, that's really going to impose into the neighborhood. The people along Melton, the other side of the tracks, it's, you're going to be looking right down into the properties. It's pretty overly aggressive. The parking, it's, there's not enough parking. And, and this is the first notice we got for this. I didn't hear anything about the Jade Street. Um, our neighbors on our street, this is the first notice that we received for this project. Um, but also, our street will be so impacted, more speeding cars, which we already have, um, overflow parking from your project. How many spots are, how many guest spots are going to be also accommodated for this, besides the 70? Because you can't really park in the trailer parks. You can't park on 38. There's no streets there. The only street to park on is going to be on Melton. Reposo, the next street up, which is Capitola, is permit parking. Our street is by default, so nobody maintains our street. Capitola, Santa Cruz, that corner is covered in potholes all the time. And on the street, who's going to maintain the extra traffic? Because that is a cut-through street. It's going to increase a lot of traffic on our street. And then the parking. Somebody goes to spend the night or you have... Parents, they have kids. Well, their kids get a little older. They get a vehicle. Where are they going to park? On our street in front of our houses. Capitola gave Reposa parking permits when Spa Fitness moved in because our neighborhood became their parking. Then they built that structure. Well, that's why they got the parking permits because before that, it was a mess. Everybody parking there. Um, but yeah, how many guest spots? Our street's going to be really heavily impacted by this because Melton is a cut through. A cut through. We can't get speed bumps on the street. We'd like to get parking permits if this goes on. Um, but 70 spots is just, it's really not enough for that. Um, yeah, and then like the privacy in the backyards along there, that 40 foot, it should be no more than a two-story building. The ones they built on the corner of 38th and Bromer on the uh, west side there, it's a nice, there was a vacant lot across from the water catchment. It's a nice little project in there. They're all two-story. Up 38s used to be recycled lumber. Old Gene owned the place, loved it. But you got one side, you've got the storage lockers. The other side's like commercial buildings. 
And then those are two stories. There's nobody being impacted by that there. This is just a little overly aggressive, I think, with the three-story and a 40-foot high there along all those houses on Melton, the trailer park. Um, you know, like the one they did over here off of Nova, they don't really have windows on that back side or just bathroom windows up high. But that's so that the people aren't just peering down into the neighbor's yards. And that's what this is going to be with this. So, but yeah. And the impact, and again, our street, it's by default. Nobody maintains that. Thank street. you. We do have other speakers. Thanks for your comments. Hello, commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Janine Roth. Um, I live in Santa Cruz, but I have family that's in Capitola. Um, I'm also with Santa Cruz Yimby, and you received a letter from us yesterday in support of this wonderful project. A key point of that letter is that this one development project is really an opportunity for you to add affordable housing to our community. In the last eight years, in the last cycle, you, we only added seven such affordable homes. This one project alone would add seven times that amount. In the staff report, you see that the project is general, consistent with the general plan, consistent with the zoning code, it meets design review criteria, it's consistent with the local coastal plan and other coastal findings. I noted also that there were multiple traffic studies that showed minimal effect on traffic in this area. But one of the things that I'd like to also point out that's really notable about this project, and we've seen a lot of projects going up in the county of Santa Cruz, is there's a really a large number of one, two, and three bedroom units, homes. Midpen, as you saw, they anticipate 13 three bedroom homes. That's fantastic for families. This is designed as a family community. It really shows. There's a playground, there's multiple communal spaces. So since this, this is about homes for peoples, I'm actually gonna, I had already planned, but Midpen did a little bit of this already, but I had already planned to just go through who some of those families might be that would be living in this place. One family might be two teachers with two children, and they could live in one of these homes for less than 2,000 a month. Another family might be, I did look up also the salaries, a maintenance worker here for the city of Capitola. They could live in the family with a rent of less than $1,700 per month. And yet another is a young couple with small children. They might both work in hospitality or retail, which is really important to the city. They could live in one of the homes for less than $1,300 a month. Your last housing element showed that the median house price, the median rent price for a three bedroom unit was over $3,000. <coughs> These families can't live in Capitola otherwise. So I just want to encourage you to approve this project. It helps the people that work here to live here. These are the teachers and the essential workers of our community. So let's Let's welcome them in as neighbors and please approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, commissioners. Ooh, a little bit loud. Um, my name is Grace Stetson um, and I fully support this project. I first moved here as a housing and homelessness reporter based in Santa Cruz County. And at that time, a few years ago, it was the most difficult housing market that I've ever experienced in my life, even compared to Brooklyn, Chicago, and Seattle. And it's only gotten worse. Um, within the last month alone, I know of at least five people that have had to leave the area because they cannot find sustainable, affordable housing options. And so I think we really need to commend the work that organizations like MidPen do to really develop additional affordable housing here in our community, especially 100% affordable housing, and see what we can do with this project. I live very close to 1500 Capitola Road and have seen that project come into fruition over the last few years since I've lived in Santa Cruz. 
And it has been such a boon to the community. I've really enjoyed seeing people be able to come to Santa Cruz Community Health in Dientes. And I'm even more excited to see people move into those units of housing when they become open soon. It's so vital to have affordable housing options in our community, as many individuals have already shared. Uh, we need affordable housing for people that are working in our schools as firefighters in our cities, in our counties. And so I really just want to emphasize the importance of this project and really encourage you to approve it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lola. I'm a UCSC student. Um, I'm also involved with the UCSC Student Housing Coalition, and I want to express my support for this project. I really appreciate the inclusion of secure bike parking um, for folks living at this property because, um, as someone mentioned, um, bike theft is such a big issue in, throughout our county. Um, I think the Lack of parking is actually, lack of parking is actually great. Um, I'm car free. There are so many people in our community who are car free by choice and choose to get around via walking, biking, and transit. And the location of this property, uh, this development, and its um, proximity to services uh, makes it even more feasible to get around without a car. So. I think the amount of parking is perfect. I'm really happy that MidPen is moving towards more sustainable uh, land use options and um, maximizing like the land use on this parcel for more housing rather than more parking. We need housing for people, not cars. And so I really appreciate that. Um, it's really exciting that projects like this are being built throughout our county that people can actually afford, that I can afford to live in this county after I graduate. Um, uh, you know, family, families can live here, commuters, turning commuters into um, neighbors, and those commuters who are, you know, needing to commute in, into Capitola can actually afford to live here and raise their families here. So I'm really excited about this project. I don't think that parking is a serious issue. I think this is a trend that we're seeing uh, throughout our county. Uh, projects aren't being built with a lot of parking and I don't see it as an issue. I think the young people that are moving into this county don't want to have to live with a car. Families want to be able to live car light in our county. So this is really exciting. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Keith Greninger. I also live on uh, Mountain Street with my neighbor, John. Um, the first we've heard of this project at all uh, on the adjoining street there. Sounds like a wonderful project. Seems like a very good design that people, um, but it seems to me like as local residents, we're gonna need a little more time to kind of be able to communicate and all work together to try to figure out the impact, as John said, and, you know, a lot of things to take into consideration. It is a, a large project for many of us. So I'd just like to, is there any sense of a time? I guess we don't talk back and forth, right? Okay. So I'd like to suggest that. I'd like to suggest more time. We just got the little green postcards a couple days ago. We didn't know about the J Street. So that's just something I'd like to suggest. I think it's real important to have time for all of us to work together and to communicate as neighbors and such. So that's what I'd like to say now. Thank you. Anybody else would like to speak? No? Hearing none, I'm closing the public hearing for... Um, and before we move on to the Planning Commission deliberation, um, I'd like to offer the applicant the opportunity to respond with question, to respond to questions. Would you like, would the applicant like to respond to any of the public comment questions? No, you're okay. Okay, 
we have oh, okay so um we're going to bring it back to Del planning commission deliberations sorry <laughs> does anybody have where we would like to start I'm sure um so one thing um i'd like to um just go over a couple things out so the mailing notice uh brian uh, you mentioned before was by code 300 feet is that correct 300 feet code standard yes right, and um the city did 500 feet the same in a north south direction east west we stuck with the, the 300 feet just because of the way the streets lay out it would would have gone across 41st which um is not a logical Endpoint. So yeah, we went north and south 500. Was that in response to like the other project that we've done before, like the one that was a 4401 or that yeah, like feedback? And just generally speaking, project like this, uh, we want to we want to expand the, the notification area, um, and particularly you know with when there was a parking reduction request, we wanted to get uh, neighbors noticed uh, that have a street that could be potentially impacted. Um, and then follow up just to some comments that were made about the community meeting that was held at the J Street. Was that then by, driven by applicant process, right? Because the city doesn't drive that process? Yeah, staff did not, did not attend the meeting. And so that was an you know, applicant trying to outreach to the community? Correct. Okay. Um, so thank you. Um, so sorry, a um, couple of questions regarding parking. So on a project like this, what's the requirement to have for parking if we could just highlight that and then how many parking spots are noted on this project so uh, density bonus projects um there's a the state ha has a table uh, that the applicant is proposing to follow um, which includes one parking space for studios and one bedrooms and one and a half for two and three bedrooms uh, and so that would net out to 66 parking spaces and they're proposing 70 uh, so there's a remainder of four for staff and guests. All right. Um, a comment was made about the lighting. Was there, um, like RM, does they do that from a review standpoint for light uh, infrastructure and stuff like that? They did look at that, and, and staff did look at it too. Um, so uh, the lighting standards are 12 feet tall, code standard for a lighting standard, which is the pole, to be clear. Uh, it, the limitation is 15 feet, so it's below that standard, and all the lighting fixtures themselves are either shielded um, or with a globe lens, and they're all dark sky compliant, which is, is our standard. Right. Um, that's all I have right now. I might have a couple more. That's the last one. Thank you. Yeah, I <clears throat> actually thought... I'd would like to commend the applicant. I think it's a good design from a design standpoint. Um, pretty good use of the land. I am a concerned about the noise on that mobile home park next door, Shangri-La. I, I don't know if a cement fence would work. I, I don't know how you, this wooden fence is anyway. But when trucks go in there, it's going to be kind of noisy. I can guarantee you. The notification thing. I think we've got. This is the second project where we've been hit with. I'll call it insufficient notification for the public nearby, and I don't know what we can do about that. I mean, the city follows their rules, which are the little green cards that John and Keith got in a week or so, whatever the requirement is, two weeks before the meeting? Ten days. Ten days, but they didn't didn't get anything before that, um, and the same thing happened on 4401 Capitol Road, and we delayed it so that people could get more notification. So we, process-wise, for these affordable housing things, we like, he just you know single them up but maybe we can figure out something else new to do for that um I, I i do did worry a little bit about keith's comment or maybe john's about the height the 40 foot height but um it's it's back it's sort of set back in, into the project itself and i think the architects have done a pretty good job of trying to you know make sure that they, there's not a lot of people that are going to see a lot of things you know when they look out their window so i i from a design standpoint, I thought that was very good. Landscaping, I thought was excellent. Um, and I understand your comments about native trees, but they're, they're wiping out 27 palms or something like that, which are not native to North America. So that's good. I'm not, and I'm not sure that redwoods really belong on the flatlands on the coast. I think they should be up in the mountains. I don't know. Um, 
and uh, the electrification is good. I like that idea. I hope that when you put in solar, you put in storage as well and get us off the grid as much as we can. I, I know it's an economic issue there, but that would be uh, a good direction for us to go because we have to electrify. And the bikes, um, actually, I did have, a, did have a question about that, but the bike, we have a lot more electric bikes now, so they have to be charged as well. I don't know if you've accommodated that. Sounds like you have. Okay, that's fine. That, I think, yeah, those are my comments. Just going to answer the <clears throat> electric bike question. Yeah, we've added a lot more electric bike charging to our previous projects, and we will look into it on this project. Someone in the in the comment also mentioned types of bike racks, um, and the bike barn where the long-term storage is is sized to accommodate a variety of bike racks, both vertical and horizontal on the ground, with ample space for things like trailers, tricycles, and electric bikes, um, and, yeah, intended to have electrical routing to it for potential chargers. Thank you. Um, what, before you said, do you, um, is there a reason why you didn't put a masonry fence between the adjoining parcel? Um, kind of. So there's, as I mentioned before, the one and a half site grade difference. So it's, um, our site is one and a half feet above the site to the south of us at Shangri-La. Right now the existing fence is such that it's exactly on that line. Um, we could look into potential potentially making it more robust, but it starts to encroach on either property line and require some additional reinforcements and structural um, requirements beyond a more traditional wooden fence. Would that be a consideration if it was suggested? I defer to MidPen. It is something we could look into, but it adds significant costs, um, and the state does um, put some limits on how much we can spend um, per unit and, and in total costs. So we're always kind of right up against that edge, mm -hmm. and, and that requirement is um, pretty challenging for that long of a fence as well. Okay, thank you. So can I just follow up on that? So the fence is like a six foot fence, is what's being proposed. That's right. And, and there's a grade difference of about two feet. So the fence or the mobile home park side will be about eight feet high. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to understand it. Yeah, I believe we're proposing eight feet the whole way. Uh, so it's going to be eight feet on your side, or so. So okay, thank you. Before you go, did you get a copy of this uh, bike rack? <coughs> Good I and did, bad. But I'd like a copy of that. That's the bike uh, bike lock options. The, the good we'll and the be bad. List. Scanned and put into our agenda packet online tomorrow. Oh, great. So we can provide it to you tomorrow. Okay. Sounds good. Well, I would like to compliment Midpin on this project. I think they did an exceptional job on the design. Um, I like the fact that they start with the two-story building on 38th Avenue and then step up the heights of the building. And with the parking on the rear of the project, it creates a nice buffer uh, from, from where the taller buildings are going to be. Um, I think the um, design itself will work real well for that area. Um, it certainly is going to provide uh, a lot of nice housing opportunities for people who live and work here uh, in Capitola. Um, I do think that um, uh, when we make our motion, we ought to include something in there that suggests to the city council that they look into improvements uh, for the adjacent residential uh, streets in this area. Uh, because um, I do think that um, with um, the parking allowances that are going in under the new state law, there is going to be some, you know, additional burden on the neighborhood around these kinds of projects. Um, so I think as part of that, the city has some obligation uh, to look at streets like Milton and Raposa and see if there are things that uh, we can do as far as improving the streets, uh, 
uh, improving the parking. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's possible to have some diagonal parking on these streets because often the city right of way is quite large. Um, you know, to help alleviate some of the burden that the adjacent residential neighborhoods are uh, going to to feel. So I hope when we make a motion um, that 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 is included in that. Um, but all in all, um, I think that um, uh, we're all working with new regulations and new laws that have only been in effect for a couple of years regarding height and density and parking so that there is more, uh, there's going to be more um, denser, uh, taller buildings than we had been accustomed to. So I think we have to make some adjustments to uh, work with everybody on that. But I think this particular project did a nice job in, in how they put it together and will be a real asset for this area in the neighborhood in the entire city of Capitola. So I, uh, yeah, I'd like to address that um, density concern as well. I mean, the city council and the, and the planning commission historically have said that Capitola is, is full. It's built out. There's no room for growth. It's been 10,000 people for forever. But um, the state came along and told us needed to grow and grow considerably. So we have a housing element and we have new regulations, as, uh, as Commissioner Westman pointed out, um, and we need to embrace the fact that there is a real need for uh, not just affordable housing, but housing in general. So it does impact parking, it does impact traffic patterns. This is something that we've been struggling with for a while now and we've approved a um, I uh, come. What was it? Uh, 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 project on Capitola Road, uh, where all these same issues came up, and uh, they were there's a lot of heated arguments. But basically, the answer is Capitola is growing, and we're going to have to grin and bear it, whether we like it or not. And I, I actually like it because I think the the need is truly there, and we're and we're just going to have to sacrifice the parking and sacrifice the. The traffic. I live in the village, so I know all about parking problems. So, anyway, um, with regards to um, putting conditions on this project, I think it is such a great project. I don't want to put any hard conditions on, other than that they're already there. Um, they've worked very well with the staff. They work very well with our consultants. Um, I think they'll take the bike rack comments uh, with the with consideration and 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 make improvements as they see fit. Again, the one thing I'm going to go back to is the, is the trees. Now, I realize there's some controversy on whether or not redwoods really belong in Capitola, and they really should be on the coast. I remember having this argument with uh, um, Ed Newman a while back, and different arborists, different agreed. But the point is, is that I, you know, I want to be an advocate for the birds and the bugs and the, and the little rodents that, in fact, inhabit these trees. And and inhabit our riparian corridor and Soco Creek and and and, and move around uh, or move around Capitola. So I think native trees. I wouldn't want to be specific, but they're uh, you know I, I looked at the just you can Google native trees for Santa Cruz County or Northern California, and you don't see any of those trees um, in this um, in this application. So. I would like to at least, when we do form a motion, to at least put a condition in there to reevaluate the landscape plan with the notion of adding more um, native trees and just leave it a soft condition and not um, just an evaluation and not, an, it's a, and not a hard condition. I, um, I would echo uh, Commissioner Westman's comments. I think it's a really well put together package. I think it's a well appropriated development. Um, having the the massing towards the rear and the um, the approachability from the front is, I think, really well thought out. <coughs> Courtyards, the quality of life that people will experience by living there, I think, has been considered and you know implemented really, really well. Um, the presentation was beautiful as well. So. Um, does anybody 
I just have two questions before. If we, Go ahead, yeah. Um, just, um, I guess just for some of the community members are here, I know in the 4401, is that the address? Uh, the one at Capitol Avenue? Yes, 4401 <coughs> Capitol Road. Capitol, sorry. Um, so, you know, came up again at that time, and parking came up as an issue. And I know um, it was, I mean, uh, very much um, emphasized on what an impact that was going to be in the community. And I know, I think the comment was taken back or it was going to be shift to council to look at potential, what the parking impacts are in neighborhoods like this. And, you know, at the same time, we heard from a community member tonight and we hear, heard from many from that project about permit parking and stuff. Um, maybe, you know, maybe tonight's not the night to talk about that or, or what the process is, but if you could in, in the future update us on where that is with council looking at that sort of thing, you know, because those are impacts to the neighborhood that we don't really as planning commissioners, I think, get to address, but they're addressed at a different level. And so that'd be one thing. And then just overall, maybe it might be good for the, um, the community members that are here tonight to understand what the process is with us and, you know, how the uh, what planning commissioners, uh, how if we vote on a project like this tonight, what other steps or actions can be taken after this time, if there's an appeal process or whatever, just so, um, just so everybody understands what a process like that would look like. Sure. Um, first question I can give a little bit of insight on. Um, so after the, the previous affordable housing development was approved at 4401 Capitola Road, the um, many conversations have occurred with our um, public works director on the need to list those avenues for um, capital improvement projects in the future to really think about redesigning those streets and the possibility of adding more parking spaces, whether it be diagonal. So that is definitely on her radar. And um, every year you update your capital improvement plan. It's a five-year plan. So I'll, I'll bring this up as well as at this location. Um, the second question was about the appeal per process. So if the Planning Commission were to approve this tonight um, or continue it, um, but if it were approved tonight, it it initiates the appeal process. And I don't want to get this wrong, but I believe it's a 10-day appeal process. And I, I think it's 10 calendar days, not 10 business days. And if the 10th day were to fall on a Sunday, it would be extended to Monday. Or if Monday was a holiday, it would be extended to the Tuesday when City Hall is open. So it's a 10-day appeal process. Um, and that would have to be submitted to our city clerk. Yeah, thanks. I just think it's important to everybody know what mm -hmm. avenues. And then we'll if it were appealed, the next the city council would review the project. All right. Thanks for explaining that. Yes. So I'm curious how you would put a motion together involving <laughs> streets. Okay. Just um, <laughs> and I do think it's important um, because there's the recommendation actually has four parts. If someone could actually read the recommendation in there and then any amendments to it, because um, just legally. I'm looking for that. Are you talking about the? Could you pull up the slide, Brian? My. We'll pull up the slide so that you have it. Okay. So I will make a, is that a I'll make a motion um, to approve the project on 38th Avenue uh, with the uh, finding that the project exempt is exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15332 uh, as an infill development and that we approve the applicant's request for a density bonus, concessions, and reduced parking under state density bonus law based on the findings and analysis included in the staff report and subject to the included conditions of approval. 
uh, approved the design permit pursuant to the findings and analysis included in the staff report and subject to the included conditions of approval and approve the coastal development permit pursuant to the findings and analysis included in the staff report and subject to the included conditions of approval uh, that are in the staff report and with the added conditions uh, that the applicant um, investigate uh, whether or not it's feasible to put in a concrete wall between this project and the mobile home park uh, and see if that could be fitted into their project and also investigate um, the landscaping plan to see if it's possible to include more native trees in that site. And that the staff be directed to uh, send a communication to the city council saying that the planning commission feels it's important for the streets uh, surrounding this project, including Milton Avenue, uh, be considered for public works capital project improvements that could help relieve some of the additional parking burdens. Um, and that's my motion. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> I second. A motion and a second. You... Can I add one more oh, sure. addition since we're giving staff mm -hmm. questions? Um, that in the process of um, Affordable housing applications that the applicant be uh, advised to engage the public more in their design process. I don't know exactly how to word that, but more Jade Street Park or Jade Community Center meetings would be nice. Right. I, I don't think that applies to this particular application. I think maybe at the end of our meeting when we give commission comments, we could direct staff to do that at that point. As the maker of the motion, that's my feeling. I agree. I I don't accept that friendly emotion, friendly amendment. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I think we have a motion in a second. Yeah. Commissioner Esty. Commissioner Jensen. Aye. Commissioner Westman. Aye. Commissioner Welk. Aye. And Chair Christensen. Aye. And it's approved. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to item 6B is 2175 41st Avenue, Suite A. It's for a conditional use permit and a master sign program to transfer the location of the existing retail cannabis establishment, the hook from the current 4170 Gross Road location to, the, to 2175 41st Avenue, Suite A. Um, we're, we've moved on. Thank you. Public. Okay. Thank you, uh, commissioners. I've got a, a brief slideshow here for this project. So, 2175 41st Avenue. I've got the, this brick. Um, I guess you could call it a horseshoe-shaped building uh, dating to 1962. Uh, traditionally had three tenant units uh, framed up by the, the three arches. And uh, in 2002, uh, there was a um, tenant improvement to, to have a new unit within there. Um, and so th there has never been a tenant in this unit. Uh, and so the proposed tenant to, to uh, relocate is the hook. Uh, which is located 521 feet away on Gross Road. Um, the Hook is a retail cannabis um, business. Ryan, one second. I apologize. Could you guys please take the conversation outside? Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Sorry. Apologies for interrupting. Uh, so they have an existing retail cannabis license, and so this is to relocate. Uh, the code requires that they have a new CUP issued and a referral from the police chief 
uh, and then they have to uh, have the state update their location with their licensing. Uh, just in review of the application, planning did meet with uh, the police, and uh, they did not have, raise any any issues with this relocation. In fact, their feedback was that this this location is a little bit simpler to patrol, just being out on a more primary thoroughfare. Um, so I did mention that uh, this was created in 2000, uh, 2022. It's 923 square feet interior. Uh, the existing signage on the building uh, dates back to uh, the 1960s and its original motif. Uh, the center unit has a, a newer uh, sign, but uh, the, the two flank, the liquor sign and the um, laundry sign are, are uh, dating from the 1960s. So, um, those signs center on the three arches and horizontally and then vertically below the, the parapet and above the arch. Uh, the, that existing signage just by uh, the code standards of the regional commercial code and sign allowances far exceed um, what is in the current standard as a 50 foot square foot cap. Uh, and then the existing signage, um, it, it uh, with my final bullet here, I'm just trying to make a note that uh, the linear footage of this building is about 260 feet and the existing signage is 166. Uh, so relative to the scale, the signage doesn't really look out of place, but relative to the cap, it's far exceeding. So uh, the solution that we worked with the applicant on was to present a master sign program. Um, properties with four or more tenant units are eligible to do a master sign program. And it's typically about creating a theme or uh, some overall offset or to the, the property. Uh, in this case, um, we looked at uh, what would another wall sign look like and it would really disrupt the symmetry. Uh, and so we focused on the, this applicant having a window sign and being the only tenant to have a monument sign. And um, what you found in the, in the packet updated on Tuesday uh, the applicant has made a, another revision, which is on, on the desk in front of you. Um, so I'm going to go over a little bit of that now. And um, the linear footage of the, the tenant space is 27 feet. And so they've centered their two signs on uh, maintaining that maximum. Uh, they're proposing now tonight uh, a modification to the size. And that's a, that would be to the monument sign. It's a circular sign and it has a, a tree that... Uh, sticks out a little bit from the edge. So they draw a box of five feet by five feet around that, which is a little bit smaller than what you saw on Tuesday. Uh, they're looking to center this in the landscape island that's in the photo on the lower right. Um, and they're also looking to have it five feet behind and have a total height measured from the sidewalk, a uh, maximum of eight feet. So we don't measure where it's actually sitting. We measure from the lowest surface nearby, which is the sidewalk. Uh, and that matches what the code uh, would require at this location, but it would be built into the master sign program uh, if the commission so approves it as pre presented. For the window sign, uh, what you saw on Tuesday was to have a nine square foot sign, uh, but with rounding out uh, or reducing the, the size fit in a square of the monument, they're, they're only left with two square feet, so they'd reduce that sign size as well uh, to two square feet. And then um, they're proposing 10 to 12. Uh, these are bunch grass plants to uh, add some green uh, life to the planter uh, that's at the front. And I've pulled a picture. This is a drought tolerant uh, type of bunch grass that they're presenting uh, this evening. And this was our, our master sign program that uh, was presented in the staff report. And so we would, uh, if the commission uh, is amenable to the applicant's modifications, we would update this to reflect those. And the last item I want to discuss is, um, so during the review, uh, staff did an, an inspection of the property with the building official to look at egress. And there is a, potentially a need to uh, address the means of egress right now. There's only one door uh, operating that goes into the building from the storefront. Um, 
record plans of record show that there was an internal communicating door to the salon unit uh, that's been walled off by the salon tenant. Uh, so there was a condition that we had uh, in the packet, which is the top one here, the business owner shall apply for a building permit to install or relocate the existing secondary means of egress prior to opening for business. Um, since the time that staff uh, went out and did the inspection, we've been communicating with the applicant and their architect. They would like um, they would like us to change the language to the tenant space egress and access will be evaluated by the building official to determine if or what modifications are necessary. Uh, and really, this is just an we may end up in the same place with the same solution, but it's it's just to say they may not need um, to create a whole other door. It may end up being a double door. Uh, it may be reversing of a hinge uh, for the way that the door swings. So there could be several options. And so I think the applicant was a little bit sensitive to the top condition being a little bit more definitive as what to what the solution was. So um, I, I think we'll, we'll likely end up at the same place, but there may be multiple ways to solve the issue. Uh, and then just to give you a, a graphic, uh, so that this is the tenant space, 923 square feet. <coughs> Uh, this is a double acting hinge door. The strike side is on the right hand side. Uh, there may, when I mentioned flipping the hinge, uh, if this door was swung all the way open, it would potentially block the means of egress. Uh, so flipping a hinge or adding a second door or adding a door here or working with the salon, and this is the communicating door to reopen this. Those are all potentially possibilities for providing this solution. Um, if they did have to modify the storefront, uh, I, I did, had a discussion with the, the building official about the, the style of the storefront um, and whether that type of product could be modified. And the, his conclusion was it's a pretty typical product um, and they should be able to match the mullion and um, find a, a product that would be modular enough to fit into the, to the space. So we weren't really anticipating a design impact uh, to this, whatever the solution is to this modification of the storefront. So with all of that, uh, we, we, for as far as the use is concerned, we're recommending approval. Uh, we want to get commission feedback, certainly on the, on the master sign program. Uh, and we are okay with the modified condition as the applicant uh, would like all the flexibility that they can get with uh, solving the egress issue. And I believe the applicant is here and, and may want to introduce himself. Is, is the new picture to scale? The other one was not. It's yeah, they're, not they're all probably not. I, I can't. Are they close? Say any of them are, are really to scale. I, I did want to inform the planning commission tonight. So we have, you have a, um, kind of two applications in front of you, one to relocate a conditional use permit, the other for the sign. And with the last minute addition of materials, if the planning commission wanted to, you could um, take two motions tonight, one on the relocation of the business and a second on the sign if, if necessary. Was just a question, was there any feedback from the community regarding issues with the relocation that we heard? We had no public comment. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Kyle Giacchino. Uh, I'm one of the founders and co-owners of The Hook Outlet. Um, I'd first like to say I'm greatly appreciative to be able to be standing before you and say that we've been able to be in business in the city of Capitola since 2020. Um, it's been a great privilege and we look forward to the opportunity to move locations to a more visible and hopefully successful location that will have less opportunity for crime as well. Um, I also would like to thank um, the, not only the police department um, in Capitola but also the uh, city staff for the work that you guys have done and Brian um, to get us to this point. Um, I, I appreciate your recommendations for approval and um, would be happy to answer any questions that you guys may have. Thank you. Do we have any questions for the applicant? I have some comments for later when we have our discussion. Okay. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> Are we following the past, the other one? 
the, the no, we'll other. No, go to public hearing. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I was trying to reference his list and then my, okay, anyway. So, so opening up for public hearing, do we have anybody on Zoom? Do we have any public comment? So we don't currently accept Zoom public comments. Oh, thank you. Um, we do have participants on Zoom, but no public comments. Okay, thank you. So hearing none, um, we're going to close the public hearing and um, bring it to deliberation. So I, I would like to start. I'd first like to say I have absolutely no difficulty with the use and the use permit. Uh, for them to move to this application on 41st Avenue. I do have strong concerns about their sign application. And um, uh, my concerns start with the fact that, um, you know, we're, we're reviewing this under the master sign permit. And if you go back and you read what the master sign permit is, uh, there is to create a, you know, common theme among the signs that are going to be in a particular shopping center and set up criteria so that when those businesses change, staff can approve the new signs without it coming back to the Planning Commission. And in this case, um, you know, I don't see any common theme being developed in this master sign program. And in fact, I see the sign that's being proposed being in violation of our ordinance for monument signs that they can only be eight feet tall because when you look at, and that's measured from the sidewalk, when you look at, you know, a five-foot sign, and now I think they're proposing it, to be 18 inches off and then it's going up in the planner, which I will confess I did not go. I went out and looked at but didn't measure because I didn't have it, but it's at least two feet tall. The whole signage, uh, you know, is going to be over the eight feet that we typically allow for a monument sign for, you know, the major shopping centers. And so, um, I, uh, you know, I may be on my own, but for me, there's, there's no way I can approve one of the largest signs to go on 41st Avenue for a 926 square foot business that's, you know, going into one of the existing shopping centers. I just think this is bad planning. I think it's a bad use of our ordinance. And um, while I would like to see his business be successful, I'm more than willing to, you know, consider a good sign to go in there that's going to help them out as, you know, well is conform to what the city's regulations are. Uh, I don't think we have it. We're supposed to have a landscape plan for this area where the sign uh, is going in. The ordinance requires that. Um, and so I don't, I don't think with the information I got tonight and uh, what's going on with the sign that I would be prepared to approve the sign tonight. But I don't think that should impact them going forward with their use permit and um, they have work to do on the building itself and I would like to see uh, staff be given the opportunity to you know work with the applicant and come back with an appropriate sign packet for us to consider. Well, can we ask staff to comment on that because um, you know Commissioner Westman pointed out that this is not to not to code um, do you defer or have a difference I mean, with that? Do the numbers, if you add five feet and you add the 18 inches and then you add the height of the thing, it's over eight feet tall. So the, the planner is two feet tall and the, the, it really would depend on the post height. So I think as represented in the, the graphic, it looks like the post might be a couple of feet tall, and then if you had a five-foot tall sign on top of that. And the new thing we got, he said 18 inches. Okay. It was 24, and they lowered it to 18. So if it was 12, then it would be compliant. Two feet plus five plus a foot. Uh, right. I, I don't think that... Um, well, first of all, I'm not certain that it's compliant under the master, if this is the appropriate use of a master sign program, because uh, what's the theme of the project? 
what's the theme for the other signs? I mean, we don't have any of that information. So I would just like a little more time for staff to be able to work with the applicant and come up with a plan. I'm not sure what, so let me just pull the string on that. I'm not sure what, what more they would do. So, uh, I mean, are you suggesting that it's not in the theme? This should be some brick monument thing because it's a brick no, building, I'm not or saying it should be a brick monument thing. I'm uh, for me. Um, I think if we're going to put up one of the what's going to be one of the largest signs on Forty First Avenue, okay, um, that we need to make certain that this sign conforms to our regulations, that we have complete and accurate information to make our decision on. The ordinance talks about, you know, that master sign plan being written out, that there be an actual landscaping plan for where this sign's going to go. We don't, we don't have any of that. Well, I think we do, didn't, isn't this? If, did you go out and look at that planter today? Or? I, didn't spend, I went to the site, but I didn't spend much time on the planter, no. Well, but it's, it's basically just filled with weeds. And so now they've come up with these bunch grasses as their landscape plan. Yeah, and for me, that's not an adequate landscape plan. Maybe for you, but not for me. Okay, so your concerns are the height and a better landscape My plan. Is the height and size of the sign, the landscape plan, and how they're going to integrate this into the theme with the other signs that are going to go on the building when new signs are going to go up there. So, so that's a, I don't understand that part either. So, they already he already talked about there's three existing signs for the additional you know it was supposedly originally three businesses. So if there's going to be a fourth business, if they're going to have any signage, they're either going to have to disrupt the, that theme or come up with something like right. this, which is a monument sign. Right. So that's the. And That's this, the thing. This one isn't acceptable to me. It, I'm certain it is to you. But no, I'm, not I'm to just me. trying to understand yeah. what your what your issues are. Okay. Um, my comment. Um, I like to echo what um, I heard from uh, Commissioner Westman just um, regarding having a plan. I guess more to scale, laid out. You don't even see the whole entire landscape area, and have that laid out. And um, I also have just concerns with just the timing of it coming in right before. I did go out to the site and look at it, and then we get an updated thing. It's just timing. So I like to see it more in depth and looking at the condition of it is, you know, is there landscape irrigation there? Not that we can impose on that, but how is that going to be maintained? And then my only concern would be with a sign like this, looking at that, just um, a condition I would also want to look at and make sure that there wasn't going to be any landscape uh, lighting put in that just accidentally points up at the sign and there's a lit up sign at the same time. So those are my comments. Around the sign. I don't have a problem with the relocation and I would be in favor of that so, for discussion. Yeah, I guess I'm a little confused on that. So can we do the relocation separate from the sign thing? Yes, we can take two separate motions tonight. Does the egress thing come in? Which the sign thing or the the relocation. All right, so I would can I make a motion that sure. we approve the uh, application for relocation to this uh, area, and then it, with the condition that they work with um, the building department and all that to a proper egress situation, proper egress plan. I'll second that. First, and a second on a on the first part of the change of use, right? Can we do? Can we? Finalize that one before moving. Okay. So the motion, just for the record, is to approve the relocation and direct staff to work with the project applicant on the signage. On the ingress and on the ingress and egress. egress yeah. We're gonna take two separate motions. Right. One on the <laughs> relocation of the conditional use permit, the second on the sign. Okay. So Commissioner Esty. Aye. Commissioner Jensen. Aye. Commissioner Westman. Aye. Commissioner Wilk. Aye. And Chair Christensen. Hi. Okay, so for the second part, the signage, do you have anything? <laughs> so I make a motion that we continue the signage application to our next meeting, 
to give the um, applicant time to work with the uh, staff and come back with a monument sign uh, and plans that are to scale, uh, include the landscaping requirement, and um, uh, show the actual um, size and how the sign, where the sign's going to be located. Actual plans. Actual plans. Yes, so that would be more discussion on that. Yes, I have something to add. So I, I just would like to give them as much direction as we can. So are we okay with the actual design of the sign, the material of the sign itself, steel painted? Uh, is that, is that going to come back as something we're going to have a debate on, or are, or are the issues just give us more information on the landscape plan and the things we just discussed? Well, I can't tell you how I'm going to vote on it because that's not legal. I will say that, you know, I, I, I'm not opposed to having a metal sign. I'm not too opposed to, you know, having something similar to what we've seen. I want to see it in its whole context. Is there a second? A, I, I was. Um, is there any way to work with the building owner to um, enhance the overall landscape? Just, I mean, having yeah, go ahead, come up if you want to. But just, my overall concern is looking at this building. I've looked at it my entire life. Um, there is zero screening, like no trees, no canopy. It's just this. I mean, I used to do laundry there when I was a teenager, and it was baked in the sun constantly and it just has no curb appeal. And I mean, not that that's necessarily your responsibility, but it's we agree. okay. Thank um, you. We have, we have actually talked with the, with the owner of the property and trying to do a few things when it comes to the trash enclosure um, and what that, that area is as well as it, that's on the other side of that, yeah. that planter Hedge. box. Um, the planter box we've brought up numerous times that it, we need to have some kind of landscaping done. And if that, meant that I need to bring a weed eater and do it myself, but it's something needed to happen because it, it looks um, not inviting in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we are 100% in agreement and trying to work with uh, the, the current owner to make some changes. Yeah. I, I mean, I would love to be able to condition this to say that we need to introduce a certain number of trees, like to match the, the general cityscape along 41st Avenue. I, I, my only concern or thought with that is that little that box is relative. It is relatively small. Yeah. Put a tree in there. I, I mean, I'm not currently studying botany, but I have a degree in botany from UC Santa Cruz, and I can tell you my, most of those trees probably wouldn't have the ability to get their, their roots sufficiently yeah. into the ground to, to survive. Mm -hmm. So there could be some, some smaller ones that are more shrub or bushes that are larger than the current um, the current ones that we were proposing, but we were trying to keep the current landscaping proposal, something smaller that wasn't going to block, block any view to the building or into the parking yeah. lot. Um, so. I think I think more what I'm, like the neighboring building, the men's warehouse building, oh, yeah. <laughs> just having those those big broadleaf trees that create shade screening, um, but not obstruction. They're not just, you know, blocking the whole building. It's just complementing. And then maybe some flowering plants or just something besides box hedges. <laughs> But um, I, I, I don't know exactly how to incorporate that within the condition and then how to incorporate the build, obligate the building owner. But um, I think just providing direction tonight that that's what you'd like it to come back with. Would, if we're continuing the application, you don't have to place conditions. Okay. Yeah. Because we have a motion. Okay. Second. Move on. All right. <laughs> you do. We'll call vote. Commissioner Esty? Aye. Commissioner Judson? Aye. Commissioner Westman? Aye. Commissioner Wilk? Aye. And Chair Christensen? Aye. Okay, thank you. Does that, does that give you pretty good guidance? It does. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Good luck with your move. <laughs> okay. Um, moving on, we uh, to item seven for the director's report. 
I just have uh, one item for you. I had sent out an email earlier in the week about training opportunities and also um, scheduling a future training uh, with our city attorney's office for June 6th with a 5 p.m. start so we could train from 5 to 6 p.m. and then um, go into our regular meeting on that night. And then also I in that email... I included a couple opportunities. One would be at the um, the California Planning Association conference that'll be in October um, or the following March. I'm sorry we did just miss that, but um, with the Cal Cities. So I do think the, the planning commissioner training, I, I believe you've all been to that except for Commissioner Westman, who's played that role for many years. So um, I think probably the planning conference would be an opportunity. Um, again, we would have to cycle planning commissioners through it. So please respond to that email, and I'll see what I, what I hear back. And then any Id additional ideas for training um, would be great. I would just like to reiterate, I think that it's really good for planning commissioners to you know, attend the League of California Cities in particular planning opportunities that they have because the Planning Commission is the only commission that's set up under state law. Uh, we're really a bit different and we have different obligations than some of the other commissions. We're required to act on applications that come before us, um, not just defer them off to the city council. So we do play a little different role and I think it's good for people to understand that and understand what our ob obligations are as far as reviewing and making a decision on applications. And they do offer a lot of uh, current, up-to-date, what's happening with the state law and all of that. So it, it is one to repeat if, if you'd like. But So I'll look forward to getting your feedback on that. Um, but I did want to get some direction on June 6th, if we could do a 5 p.m. start for training. Fine. Works for me. Okay. I do have one other update. Um, Elaine Johnson was here for a, a, the prior, the first application this evening, and she's with Housing Santa Cruz. And as part of our housing element update, we've committed to um, provide uh, just doing more outreach. And she and the city of Capitola are going to co-host an event about how affordable housing projects are financed. So we're scheduling that now, and um, I think it's going to be, uh, I'm not quite sure on the date yet, but we're working back and forth, and I'll, I'll let you all know once that becomes available. Okay. And with that, I have no other updates. Thank you. I, um, I have like five or six questions. Um, yeah. One thing, um, can we just talk about the process um, of like the timeline for people like turning in some like not submittals but like updating things like it's a little like I look at the reports you know and you look at the whole packet on a Friday and then there's all these updates that come in. Is there a timeline or is that just a process that the city allows to go through and like having a sign come in and, or is it like a hard dead date that we say that's a stopping period? So typically we would not want what occurred tonight to happen in terms of a last minute update right before a planning commission meeting with a modification, so we apologize. But once we do receive something like that, we're obligated by law to get that to you, so we can't prevent it from happening, but um, in working with applicants, we definitely um, do not suggest that they you know, should come in with a last minute modification, so our- I guess my question is, um, and not just but typically, whatever goes out in the packet should be, that should be it. There should be no changes between that point, but there's no we rule. Get, on like, um, like this one, we got a couple different updates, and so then I'm going back looking at the plan, and then really the update is just that you just got additional comments. So it seems like this one, I think there's like two updates, right, That emails that went out, and then the sign tonight. And so I was just trying to, you guys just update every time you get any sort of communication Anytime they submit additional information on their application, you know, geared towards their application. Right. But you're just submitting to us the comments that you get from the public. 
Yes. Uh, I, Sometimes. I think we can say that, you know, as far as the application goes, it doesn't change from the time that it came out. Um, yeah, I think it's fair to say to an applicant if they submit additional materials that we haven't had time to review them and they're not in the staff's analysis because I think it's the perfect um, example of when an item should be continued because at a staff level we haven't had an opportunity to review it against the criteria of the code so it's really unfair to ask the planning commission to do so. Um, my next one, we, we heard again tonight um, just the process of noticing um, which I think, you know, I commend the staff for, you know, expanding it and like, I guess we learn as a city, you know, like from the 4401. Um, what's the process in, or how can we improve the process in noticing about like such a large project like this um, overall? I mean, can there be something, uh, I mean, I know like there's probably some issues with the project coming through and there might be, you know, some confidentiality until a project gets to a certain point, but like, is there something on the, on the, you know, city's website that talks about, you know, potential future projects or something like that. Just, and like that Jade Street, I mean, I thought that was a great idea, but then to hear that people in the community, and you know, mm -hmm. are on vacation, something like that. But is there something that the city can do to, on these larger projects to help um, inform people? Yeah, so we, as a, do you want, well, I was just going to say the 38th Avenue project was in the city's newsletter, I believe, that the that Chloe mm -hmm. puts out and sends to anybody who wants to sign up. Anybody can, you know, sign up to uh, get our agendas. They might not want to do that, but I think we should encourage people to sign up for sort of the city newsletter that comes out because that gives people notification she has in their, you know, future projects the planning commission is going to talk about. And I know the 38th Avenue was in sort of the last newsletter or the one before that. That is that is one thing that uh, we I did talk to Chloe about last week and that we will be implementing is what are the future projects on the planning commission agendas. Right. But I, you got to be a little bit sympathetic to John and Keith. I mean, they got a three-story thing going up right next to them and they didn't even know anything about it. No, no, I, I, I agree, and I agree with your point. I think that, you know, for bigger projects, you know, the, I think the law requires a 300-foot notice. You know, I think it's that staff has to take it upon themselves to, you know, extend that noticing to a little further out. But at what, at what point do you notice people? Because you have to do the legal notice a certain number of days before the meeting. So I guess in saying this, what you're asking is, is there a way to notify people before you do the notice? Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we, have, we should, personally, I think we should put the burden on the applicant to do that. I think these mid pen tried to do it. Somehow it didn't get communicated to the public. I don't think the city has an obligation to do anything, right? I mean, so we we have an obligation to follow our public notice, which is to post it on the site 10 days before, as well as send out to 300 feet. But there is, there is a section of code in there that says that the community development director can um, utilize judgment in, and extend the notice further. And that's what we did in this scenario. We looked at... We really thought that parking was going to be the item, and just looking at where could people park. In, I mean, we call almost there's no parking on 38th Avenue. We almost encourage the applicant, you know, in the sense of like that that property's been vacant for so long. You drive by, I mean, they a note it. I mean, even a banner up like, you know, you know, I don't you can't say future because it's not approved. But I mean, you know, something talking about the potential what this could be in the. You know, I just think um, it's just a tough position that, you know, like you were saying, um, that somebody feels like they might have been gone for a certain period of time and then it's just not communicating. And I think this one, I think the staff did a lot a better job, you know, than last time. I mean, we went to 500 feet, which is great. But, and like um, Commissioner Essie was saying, just pointing more back onto the applicant about more outreach. Mm -hmm. um, just to don't, don't they put a big poster with like inch letters for we, future development? We don't do that. Um, County does that. Yeah. Ours is the letter size attached. 
But it's still posted on the on the site. Yeah, it's yeah. posted right at the front of the site. And if it's like for the trees, we posted down Park Avenue um, in multiple places. If it's a larger site, we typically, if it's a corner, you post on both sides. So but that's all in like a 10 day window period. That's not like a month out. I'm stuck like. I thought it was 30 days. Is that still the county? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Um, and then in line with that, with the tree notice issue that was brought up. Um, when he, it was that maybe just a miscommunication. You know, the tree noticing. My understanding was we had a certain amount of trees that were noticed for removal, and then once we got the addendum, that number went up. Was it three additional <laughs> trees? So that that was the issue that I how I understand it. No, I think her 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 issue was at the uh, seven twenty two Escalona. It, the notice was done on Escalona Drive, and that's proper. I think it's per the city. Team. Nobody on the other side of park, and nobody who would be interested in that Monarch Cove, uh, what is it, uh, Escalona Gulch. Nobody, nobody on that side knew about that, and they're con they probably are concerned because they they can probably see that gulch, and we're now we're not going to have much trees in the gulch. I think that's what she was saying. I don't think it was a location. Park. Okay. It was the Escalona. Yeah, that we <clears throat> and we do we we put it by the entry. You did the you, did, you followed the city. You followed the city rule. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, another one of these, well, I'm sympathetic, but. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'll say in <coughs> all of my years of doing this, this is an issue that I never saw anyone come up with a complete good solution for. There's always someone who says, I did not get the notice. And, um, you know, I think that doesn't mean staff doesn't work hard. We don't do hard everybody to let everyone know what's going on. So they do have an opportunity to participate. But I do think it's a hard problem to solve. I do like when they show up and show us that they did get the notice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was good. We've got 1,296 more houses to add. <laughs> right. Got to figure out how to tell people that's going to happen. That's yeah. I think you're trying with all this, you know, like the thing with Santa Cruz. That's a good idea. I think people are much more used to this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. I think her, Peter's description of it is, is the public, right? Mm -hmm. This is going to happen. Yeah. Got to get used to it. Yep. And Lola was right. We're going to have a lot more bikes than cars at some point. Mm -hmm. I actually like the fact that they made it not. So, like smaller volume, you know, it's not just packing a 75 foot building, or, you know, it's giant massive structure there. All right. So, sorry, I have three more. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when we look at these projects and they always get around CEQA, what's the overall plan or anything of when the city's going to address the impact on the community? Like when you don't run the CEQA, so you aren't looking at the impact on the streets, police, and all that stuff. Just asking, when does that get looked at in a sense when every project is exempt from looking at it? One day those are all going to snowball and then. This sounds very familiar from our housing element update, correct? But um, there are so many exceptions built into the state law these days that, I mean, um, Brian made the point in his um, presentation tonight, like vehicle miles traveled. The infill development, we don't even look at that because it's infill development. It's next to 41st Avenue. Um, however, we they studied it for us to see what the impact is to the street, but you could never deny the project because of that. So I think the answer is there is going to be incremental changes in Capitola. There is going to be impacts to traffic. But under the, the way in which um, the CEQA has changed, I, I don't think there's much we can do about it. If we were a community um, such as the county and someone was proposing an affordable housing develop or any any housing development out on the edge of the county, um, not near services in the rural area, that would have a harder time passing uh, CEQA. But because we are developed and we are an infill area, it will see the incremental changes. And I think that from the state's perspective, um, we're hoping to get better transportation corridors and public transportation to alleviate the impacts that are associated with these. But um, it's there's 
I think it's because of our existing form that it'll be challenging to. Right, and I, have to, and I talk like infrastructure and even just the impact on sewer, right? I mean, and I've mm-hmm. heard many people say, oh, these people are already here. Um, and maybe that's true. Um, and, you know, there are five people in a bedroom and now you're spreading them out a person in each room, and so there's not a sewer impact. But just infrastructure, I know we're not going to resolve it tonight. I just, I just want to you know, keep bringing it up that, I mean, anyone, you know, I know, like, the city council just looked at budgeting. You know, uh, you start adding more people, you know, you need more police response. And, you know, sewer impact, which I know the city is not responsible for sewer, but, I mean, I think one day it's all going to snowball into a huge impact. And then everybody's going to say, well, there's no money for that. And it's going to say, well, you know, so we're not, we're not going to resolve I just wanted to make that comment. Um, the next um, thing is, is there, um, um, where, how are we doing with permits? Like overall is like, um, just looking at the city from a permit, like do you see a lot of like uh, remodels and stuff happening and a lot of uh, like the economic uh, status of capital improving from improvements and stuff like that? And then, or do we have any new ADUs going in that you're seeing coming in? I'm gonna um, let senior planner really respond to this one who's more up to date with the yeah, we, we have had a uh, kind of an uptick in activity um, on, at my desk it's a lot of use permit type of applications you have one new residence doesn't have an ADU uh, and then I think through our associate planner uh, it's got four or five residential projects that came in and maybe two ADUs there I think it's like valuable information like as I go around and talk to people you know they're like, you know if you know, is the economy down? And, you know, I talk about a lot of things, like, from over the hill standpoint, but, like, it'd be nice to, I don't know if there's a way that gets just overall communicated to us. Like, you know, even if it's a small project, we might not see it, but if somebody's, you know, adding on, it doesn't have to come through to us. But just knowing how the community's changing also, because all those small changes, just adding on a, a, an additional room or something like that, it, it's just an overall impact, I think, at the city. It's just good to know how things are trending. So I don't know if there's a way to share that information. Not in detail, but I mean, like maybe every once in a while in a summary or something. Would maybe yeah, they, I, maybe one option be to say, okay, could you just like give us a report on what the over, over the counter approvals are so we can at least see what's going on? You know, we can run reports out of our system on building permits. Is that? Yeah, I was just. Or, or I guess the question is really, um, I think building permits would probably be the easiest way to gauge that because a lot of planning permits come in and sit incomplete and then, you know, there's, there, and they don't get built. But uh, building permits, I could run reports on that monthly for you. Yeah, that'd be great. And then, sorry, and um, I've asked this before, um, any uh, movement on the having a discussion back to our group about the Architectural Review Committee? Yes. Um, so we're working on the the updates to the code now. Ben Noble is, and I'm hoping um, I'm, I'm a, I estimate that it'll probably be the June meeting because there's there was quite a few changes in there um, for updates. But I I told him we have to have this all adopted by the end of the year. <laughs> so he's kind of he's working through the updates, and I think based on how much how many applications we have on certain planning commission meetings and where Ben's at in the proposal. Um, we'll be bringing that back, but definitely by June. I just don't know where the other commissioners stand on that issue. I, it, I'm an advocate for it, but that's just myself. But just having um, that discussion sooner than later, because at the end of this year, there'll probably be changes on planning commission. And so I wouldn't want that to come in in November. And then we're really maybe trying to work through a process and then, in December, there's changes and things move on, and there's a whole new planning commission that has to be in the middle of it or re readdressing it. So that would just be from a time standpoint. That's a, that's a more of a sensitive issue to me on that one, um, and I know the other ones are you know in the process. So. I do plan on uh, reaching out to recent applicants that have worked in Capitola over the years to get their feedback as well. I thought that would be important for just to, to understand from local, the local architect's perspective with no longer having the Arc and Site Committee, but the development design review, get some feedback there. So that's one thing that I, I would like to accomplish before we take that back to Planning Commission. But um, but I, I, the next time we do zone and code updates, the will definitely be by June, so the June meeting. 
That's it. Sorry. Thank you. That's all good. That's fine. Is there any other? Any, any oh. updates on the housing element? Oh, the housing element. <laughs> um, we're continuing to work um, with Merlin Geyer um, and continuing uh, to update red lines. And I think we're down to about two comments that I saw an email come in again earlier today that I wasn't able to get to yet. So we're close. I was really hoping to have it published tomorrow, but it's not looking like that will happen because by the time Layla and I get through the suggested changes, it'll take um, RM time to upload it into the document itself to get published. But um, working away on it and um, hopefully, hopefully next week. Can you, you have time, you think, to research that, um, that Portola Valley thing? I think that'd be something important for us all to understand, you know, if, how severe this is by even just if we think, oh, we passed it and we got it through, how we're going to have to, and the city's going to have to be, keep moving forward. And I think that's also a good tool for um, the public to see that process and why it has to keep getting refined and everything. So maybe it's just some research or something. Sure. I was, it was very alarming to me to see that. So, um, luckily, Capitol is going to be in good shape because we've approved two significant affordable housing projects this year. Yeah, and we're already working on our implementation of the zoning code. So we're we're kind of moving right along, and we're um, keeping our promises about public outreach, and uh, so we're checking a lot of the boxes. We've got. Um, George Malgoza, who's our development service tech, and he works both in planning and building. And we have a weekly meeting that we're looking at that 80, 80 item list and seeing how much further we're getting So, with updates. So. I just think it's so key on how, like you were saying, how progressive we're being in this. But also we hear on the other side from people saying, you know, oh, you know, be like, you know, Huntington Beach and, you know, and stand back. I think it's a good example to talk about what happened just in Portola Valley and to say, well, this is why we are moving forward because look at what just happened. And this isn't Huntington Beach. This is, you know, 32 miles away from here. And these are things that can happen and they use all control. So some control is better than no control. Yep. Any more questions? <laughs> Sorry, Susie. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I think with that, we're adjourned. To, we're adjourned to the next regularly scheduled meeting of the Planning Commission on May 2nd, 2024 at 6 p.m. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>